Welcome to the EPG Patshala Philosophy of Law paper. This module is on torture. The objectives of this module are to understand the key elements that justify or condemn the use of torture in the philosophy of law. This module was written by Mirko Gerasic from Tel Aviv University. I'm Akash Singrator from the U Lewis University of Rome. The history and development of torture. The term torture derives from the Latin verb torquere, that means to twist or to turn. In ancient China, torture had a number of grim forms, including slicing people alive. In India, there's a legend that Emperor Ashoka had a special chamber that was called Ashoka's Hell, fully dedicated to torture. During the Renaissance, the institutionalization of torture was reinforced as doctors were for the first time required to assist in interrogational torture. In the pre-modern world, torture was universal and quite common. It was indulged in at whim by the authorities and there was not a great deal of debate on whether it was moral or legitimate. After World War II, the world came to finally confront the topic, and it became a topic of serious concern in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where, of course, it is prohibited. In 1975, the World Medical Association, WMA, passed the Declaration of Tokyo, guidelines for medical doctors concerning torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment in relation to detention and imprisonment. So the interesting thing is that throughout history, torture has been practiced by political authorities, by police, by army, military, and so on. But something peculiar began to happen after the Renaissance. And this was that actually physicians and doctors, the people that we turned to to improve our health, were enlisted to conduct various kinds of specified uh, torture. So specialized torture conducted through the knowledge that medical doctors and nurses had of the human body. This is exceptionally perverse, but this continues to be a common standard in the way that torture is conducted internationally, that is, under the supervision of physicians. In 1982, the United Nations adopted the principles of medical ethics relevant to the role of health personnel particularly physicians, in the protection of prisoners and detainees against torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. So what constitutes torture? What is it that we mean? We've seen it uh, historically in China, in India, throughout Europe, everywhere, a kind of mutilating of people, a kind of uh, Im imprisonment without cause, and then uh, uh, twisting and turning their body in various ways to inflict pain. Torture is basically classified in three forms. One is physical, the second is psychological, and the third is called torture by proxy. Physical torture is the easiest for us to understand. Everybody has heard of it. Uh, the common methods are just physical brute violence, beating, cutting, burning, whipping, and branding like was done to slaves and, uh, and untouchables. Another common form of physical torture is sexual violence, and the introduction of the sexual element throughout physical torture really brings our attention to the way that torture is degrading and is meant to assault the, not just the flesh or the body of the person, but ultimately that person's dignity. In 1978, sensory deprivation was defined by the European Court of Human Rights as not quite torture. It amounted to the practice of inhumane and degrading treatment, but it wasn't necessarily uh, uh, prohibited in terms of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and on, in terms of a later convention, United Nations Convention Against Torture. So sensory deprivation continues to be practiced. Um, the extent of, of the harm done by it determining whether it constitutes torture or whether it constitutes degrading uh, uh, punishment. Force feeding introduces a specific form of physical torture, which is quite interesting because 
it brings in once again the role of the physician. It's always a medical practitioner involved in force feeding. Uh, the contemporary situation on this, for example, we know that prisoners in Guantanamo Bay are force fed when they attempt to go on a hunger strike against the uh, uh, what they see as unlawful impris imprisonment on this uh, uh, the island of Cuba. When they undergo uh, these uh, hunger strikes, medical doctors come and insert feeding tubes forcefully into their throats and force them to eat. Is this torture or is this the attempt to protect and save lives? Now we move on to psychological torture. Because of the difficulties in reaching an international agreement on precisely what constitutes psychological torture, this method of torture is often denied the deserved consideration. It's labeled as irrelevant. However, psychological torture can be seen as a very uh, real and concrete form of, uh, of torture. One example where this is clear is in psychiatric torture. Once again, the introduction of the medical profession into the um, uh, practice uh, of torture. This form of torture, which is uh, strangely common internationally, involves taking someone who is clinically sane, but institutionalizing them in a psychiatric hospital. If somebody is institutionalized in a psychiatric hospital, the uh, restrictions against forcefully medicating them, forcefully feeding them, and subjecting them to various kinds of interrogation uh, are reduced. So what we can do to a sane person in terms of force feeding or making them take medicine that will alter their behavior so that perhaps they tell us information we want to know, these things fall under the heading of torture and are generally prohibited. But if the person is considered clinically insane, then it's easy to force them to take drugs, which will then force them to, to do the things that we want them to do. And it's easy to force feed them. And it's easy to engage in deeply degrading practices. For example, imprisoning without following the rule of what's called habeas corpus, that is bringing the imprisoned person before a judge to see whether that imprisonment is lawful. So the most uh, concrete form of psychological torture, which shows us that this is truly a form of torture, is the uh, involuntary uh, institutionalization of sane people so that we can drug and interrogate them. Uh, what often happens in this case is that the people who are subjected to this treatment no longer know whether they are indeed sane or insane because of all of the torture that they are uh, and stresses that they are undergoing in this uh, kind of institution. A third form of torture is called torture by proxy. Now, torture by proxy has uh, two very different meanings. The first way in which it was meant and how it has been practiced uh, for a great deal of time in history was when in order to extract certain information or in order to get something that we want from a particular party, we would subject the people that he loves or innocent people uh, uh, in front of this, uh, uh, the view of this person to degrading treatment or to torture. What was most common, for example, is if we intended to extract information from a particular person that, that, that uh, uh, the uh, authorities, the torturers, would bring in front of that person uh, his children and subject them to uh, uh, physical uh, violence, torture, rape, and other kinds of harm. This is a torture by proxy. So the, uh, the, the, the father or the mother in this case is not him or herself being tortured, but it is a kind of torture to see your own child or somebody that you love be tortured right in front of you. And this was considered uh, uh, a, a deeply uh, successful way of torturing because while the human body can take uh, physical pain to great extents, what uh, strangely the medical profession has discovered 
is that it can take this kind of psychological pain to a far lower threshold. So it turns out to be, ironically, a more successful form of torture, if by success we mean extracting the information that we want, to torture by proxy than, in many cases, to torture physically the, 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 the person, uh, him or herself. In recent years, and especially in a post-September 11 environment, following the, uh, the uh, Al-Qaeda attacks in New York City, since that time, torture by proxy has gotten a, a new connotation altogether. What this means is that it's not a, uh, another person that is uh, being tortured. Rather, given that torture within uh, most of the Western world is prohibited and the uh, United Nations declarations against torture are recognized, there is a proxy way of nevertheless permitting authorities, military police, of torturing a person. This is the torture by proxy. What they do is that the authorities will kidnap or remove a person from the soil of these countries where torture is recognized as illegal and unconstitutional and violative of human rights and put that person under extreme interrogation, torture, in other countries that do not recognize the uh, conventions or that are more relaxed in terms of upholding the standards of whether torture is possible. This is known as a, uh, a, 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 a extraordinary rendition. So uh, unfortunately, India has uh, uh, allowed many of its own citizens to be rendited by uh, American and British uh, intelligence uh, authorities transferred to countries like Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and then tortured uh, in those places. The information extracted in the torturing process in, uh, let's say, Uzbekistan, which is uh, known as a black site of CIA torture, uh, the information that's extracted from the tortured persons can then be emailed or faxed to the United States or to the UK where that same torture would be illegal and where the information extracted by that torture would not be admissible in court. But in this case, since the torture happens in a place by proxy, the US authorities are in a gray zone where they're able to act on that information that was extracted through torture by proxy. So we've discussed the history of torture, we've discussed what constitutes torture, various kinds of torture, whether physical, psychological, torture by proxy. And now we move on to the ethical questions involved in torture. Prior to World War II, torture was of common practice and though common people may have had deeply moral concerns about it, the authorities in pursuing their own interests did not let the moral equation interrupt their activities. Following World War II, where we saw the height of activities of torture, physical and uh, psychological, and in fact, in fact, systematic medical torture of innocent uh, people in the concentration camps of Germany under medical supervision, all of these issues in the middle of the 20th century have pushed the moral questions of torture uh, into the public domain and there's a great deal of debate, debate about it, not only amongst intellectuals and moral philosophers and lawyers, but even amongst cabinet ministers, military personnel, and uh, 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 public and political authorities. So what has happened is that the military has evolved its own ethics in relation to the legitimacy or illegi illegitimacy of torture. This has primarily become prominent because of the global war on terror, as it's called. This has revived the debate about the permissibility of torture in a way that we haven't really seen since the post-World War II uh, 
situation. There are three main positions, moral positions, about torture. The first one we can classify broadly as consequentialist. And the consequentialist view is the most permissive view in terms of torture. I'll discuss that uh, uh, more in a moment. The second main view we can call contextual. The contextual view is, more, is less permissive than the consequentialist view, but more permissive than the third view. The third view is a kind of deontological view. So these are the three uh, uh, schools of moral philosophy that come into play in the philosophy of law when we're discussing the uh, topic of torture. So I'll deal with the first one, the utilitarian or consequentialist view. This view, some people call pro-torture. I'm not sure pe people, any individual, if you ask, would say that they're pro-torture, but it is a, a common practice and it's justified through this utilitarian view that is based on the consequences of the torture. In other words, the person who will attempt to legitimize torture will say that it might be a terrible thing for the individual person whom we torture to suffer. However, the consequences of doing this nasty thing to this particular person is of, the, of, of, of overwhelming benefit. It serves the greater good. And so the good that derives to a great number of people outweighs the bad that is suffered by the individual. And so on these utilitarian grounds, these consequential grounds of serving the greater good, we can justify torturing an individual person. Now, this is a, a, a common position that we hear from uh, uh, governments, uh, especially intelligence agencies that attempt to interrogate through enhanced means, including torture, because of the war on terror. So the claim that we hear emanating from military uh, uh, and uh, intelligence agencies is that if we don't torture terrorists or potential terrorists, then we will not be able to extract the information that uh, can prevent a far greater and far wider harm to occur. So the intelligence uh, operative will say that the war on terror is a special circumstance that requires that we understand the morality of torture in purely utilitarian terms. The second position, again midway between the consequentialist and the third position, the deontological, we can call a contextual viewpoint. This position holds that when we're thinking about the moral legitimacy of torture, that torture could be justified only under extreme, extraordinary circumstances. It could be legalized only under extreme and extraordinary case by case, which is to say contextual circumstances. The issue is that these cases are so sporadic and spread around that even the contextualist strongly resists permitting blanket laws that do permit torture. In fact, most contextualists would prefer the laws that strictly prohibit torture, but then on a case-by-case -case basis permit specific instances of torture if they are um, uh, shown to be necessary and largely beneficial and if they are supervised by proper judicial and not police or military authorities. So this contextual uh, uh, position might today be the one that is uh, most espoused by Western governments. In other words, the Western governments would like to adhere to the conventions against torture, but as they see themselves engaged in a war on terror, and in fact, we should include the Indian government uh, in this as well, uh, 
they say that under very special circumstances, we might permit the use of, they won't say torture, but they will say enhanced interrogation techniques that involve certain kinds of uh, 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 requirements for the prisoner, including standing up for 24 to 48 hours, uh, not giving food and water, uh, playing extremely loud music uh, in a room that the prisoner is unable to leave from, sensory deprivation, that means no light, no sound, uh, immersing the body up to the head in water so that they can feel nothing. All of these enhanced techniques, which commonsensically, any of us who's not a military or a police person would simply call torture. Now, the third position is the deontological one. This is the uh, position that concentrates on the dignity of the person as an inviolable principle. In other words, the deontological position is not interested in balancing or weighing the harm done to the person against the greater good that may result from that harm. That's a utilitarian or consequential position. It's also not concerned with the context that perhaps here and now we need to do this because it's more efficient or because the exigencies demand it. Its fundamental and overriding concern is that every human person is endowed with an inalienable and inviolable dignity. And therefore, torture is never justifiable since what torture does is precisely violate that dignity of the person. So deontologists and in, in uh, political philosophical terms, pluralists advocate this uh, absolute prohibition, seeing torture as an inherently immoral act that is never justifiable, either through consequences or through contexts. All right, we've been discussing the ethical boundaries of torture and the three main moral philosophical positions that uh, either legitimize, critique, or prohibit uh, torture. There's another uh, example that's often used in order to allow students to understand where they stand in the different moral philosophical positions for or against torture. And this is called the ticking time bomb example. It's quite interesting. Let's imagine that we have apprehended a terrorist, uh, a member of a terrorist group. We've apprehended one of these members. And this member knows where a certain bomb that is ticking away and certain to explode in a manner of minutes, hours, we're not even sure. We need to know where this bomb is so that we can send people to dismantle this bomb, remove the public from the area of this bomb, and save countless lives. We have this terrorist before us. The terrorist is not voluntarily offering the information of where this ticking time bomb is. So, what would you do? Would you take the position that, in this case, given the harm that's going to result to a great number of innocent people, that it is legitimate to enhance the interrogation methods of this terrorist, maybe starting with the milder forms like uh, threats or increasing to psychological harm or increasing even to physical violence electric shocks uh, and uh, other uh, techniques of torture. Would you suggest that we do this until the moment that the, that the uh, apprehended terrorist tells us where this time bomb is? Or would you say that under no circumstances is it correct to violate the dignity of this person whom we acknowledge as being criminal, as being 
uh, in some way morally repulsive. Obviously, we all agree that it's morally repulsive to put uh, a bomb in a place that would destroy the lives of innocent people. Well, there are different ways of thinking about this. We would be torturing and not killing this terrorist. And it's better to torture than to kill. And yet the terrorist is willing to kill a great number of people by not um, uh, revealing the information. Torturing this one person is a far lesser evil than letting a great number of people die. Is this a position you would take? If so, you, you fall within the utilitarian or the consequentialist paradigm. Maybe you don't see this as a blanket rule that in every ticking time bomb scenario, it is okay to torture. In, but in a certain one where the danger is clear, present, certain, unless we extract information immediately, then we would allow torturing this person. That would make you a contextualist. Or rather, do you see the morality behind this as being one where if we were to stoop to torture and violate the dignity of this person, then we're not in any way really different from that terrorist in the first place. The terrorist is willing to torture. The terrorist is willing to kill. We ourselves are willing to torture and perhaps even make threats uh, to kill the, the terrorist. Would you say that under no circumstances is it correct to torture, even with a ticking time bomb? That would put you in the deontological camp, a position that prioritizes the dignity of every person, whether innocent or guilty, uh, over the so-called greater good of the community. So we conclude now. The pro-torture positions are inspired either by a positivist approach in legal theory, such as the approach of John Austin, which you will find in the earlier modules on positivism in law, in the philosophy of law paper, or also equally by a kind of Carl Schmittian account, the Hobbesian account, that sees the sovereign or the authorities in this case as in charge of the lawmaking process and not always subject to the lawmaking process. As the one authority that's able to violate the moral norms that it demands of all of us. I had mentioned that it was during World War II that torture became uh, quite uh, uh, controversial in the public sphere and even entered into uh, the political process uh, through the UN Declaration of Human Rights, through conventions on torture, and through independent countries uh, introducing into their laws uh, prohibitions of torture. Well, in the Nazi death camps like Auschwitz, Birkenau, Dachau, there were many medical experiments that were uh, performed by uh, doctors of high prestige uh, the most notorious is Dr. Joseph Mengele, referred to as the doctor of death, who performed various kinds of torture and experimentation on Jewish people, on Roma people, sometimes referred to as gypsies, the, the, the wandering Roma people, and on homosexuals. The way that Dr. Mengele and the death camp supervisors uh, legitimized this torture was simply by declaring that these people are not human and as we allow, allow medical experiments on monkeys or on rabbits for cosmetics or for new medicines we can equally allow torture or medical experimentation on Jews or Roma or homosexuals or other sorts of people who do not really qualify as fully human persons, the way that slaves didn't before the prohibition of slavery. Now, the information extracted by these uh, processes of torture have been of enormous value to the scientific and the medical community. And this is a great irony. For example, 
we now know how long a human body can be submerged in icy cold water before they succumb to death. And this is written into every naval uh, uh, officer's uh, handbook uh, in, in case that a, a naval cadet should go overboard in icy water and so on. How do we know this information? Because in the Nazi death camps, they would submerge Jews or homosexuals in icy cold water and simply watch with the time uh, stopwatch. How long does it take for the average person to die? So this grotesque activity has led to a great deal of scientific uh, 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 knowledge. Is it acceptable? Under no circumstances do we say that it's a acceptable. Even consequentialists deny that it's acceptable, except that in this case they deny it being acceptable because they reject the premise that the gypsy, Roma, the homosexual, or the uh, Jew is not a fully human person. After World War II and after these Nazi death camp experiments, the defense of the doctors during the Nuremberg trials when these people were tried for crimes against humanity was almost in every case that I was just following the rules. This is a famous case of Eichmann during his trial in Jerusalem about which Hannah Arendt wrote in The Banality of Evil. The argument was that all of us who were conducting this kind of torture were just following the rules of the authorities. Following the rules is the legal philosophical approach of positivism. Positivism lost its influence in the philosophy of law as a consequence of these activities that happened during World War II, the torture and the defense of that torture by following the rules. And a new paradigm took uh, center stage. That new paradigm was one of recognizing natural rights. Some people refer to it as the natural law tradition, but it's slightly uh, different. You can read about natural rights in an earlier module in the philosophy of law paper, and you can read about natural law in another module in the philosophy of law paper. What's key here is that the idea of positivism or following the law to do something morally reprehensible was substituted by the primacy of the natural inalienable dignity of the person. And that is generally the approach that we take towards torture in international conventions and treaties that prohibit it. To sum up, in this module we have discussed some of the key elements both from a historical and from a moral philosophical point of view that make up the discussion and debates in the philosophy of law about the legitimacy or the illegitimacy of torture. Thank you very much.